Not only is the universe stranger than we think, it is stranger than we can think. Werner Heisenberg said that. He was a physicist and perhaps most famous for his uncertainty principle. He basically pointed out that you can't predict at any given moment where a particle might be. You might know its position, you might know its speed and direction at any given moment, but that's not to say where it will be a moment later. Knowing where particles are in time is a tricky business. Time is a tricky business. Scientists have struggled with what it actually is. Is it a construct of our minds? An illusion? Is it the same everywhere in the universe? Can you travel through it? Reading a book or a story written a century ago is a form of time travel. Carl Sagan said this when he wrote, One glance at a book, and you hear the voice of another person perhaps someone dead for a thousand years. To read it is to voyage through time. Whether time is crucial to reality, or say a story that we tell ourselves, where reality and fiction meet can make for a very strange encounter. The year is 1950. It's June in New York City, Times Square to be exact, and for the city that never sleeps, things are busy for the police officer on duty. It's been a long night, and he's tired. Suddenly, a figure catches his eye. Being that it's New York City, he's used to seeing some odd characters, especially at this hour when the bars begin to empty. But there's something different about this particular person, something peculiar. The man is wearing a high hat. It's one of those tall stovepipe looking hats. Another thing that holds the officer's attention is the man in the high hat is standing in the middle of the road, not crossing it. He's standing there, looking around with wide eyes. And then the officer realizes that the man's high hat isn't the only thing peculiar about him. Not only is his hat out of place, but the man is also wearing a coat and a vest that look like they come from another time, below which are checkered pants and shoes with buttons. In short, he looked like he'd just stepped out of a Victorian-era painting, mutton chops and all. Maybe the man worked in the theater. It would make sense given the time of night, but what didn't make sense was the fact that he looked confused as the lights changed and the cars around him began to move. Officers on duty, especially veteran officers, have a sort of sixth sense when it comes to watching people. They know when someone is in danger or needs help. This man, the man in the high hat, needed help. The man's fear, even from a distance, was obvious, especially to the officer. So the officer did what many New York City officers do, both past and present. He approached the man to offer assistance or to make sure that the man didn't pose a danger to either himself or those around him. The man didn't see the officer's approach. Instead, he appeared startled at the movement of cars around him, and he bolted for the sidewalk. He didn't see the taxi. The man in the high hat was killed instantly. It was an unfortunate and tragic accident. The officer now had to go through the sad business of identifying the man who only moments before had seemed to appear out of nowhere in the middle of the road. There would be next of kin to inform, a report to write, perhaps multiple reports, and all sorts of other unpleasantries, all of which had suddenly, in the briefest of seconds, landed in his lap. A search of the man's pockets deepened the mystery. With each object, the officer's spirits sank. This was not going to be a routine matter. He first removed a copper token for beer that was worth five cents. There was a name of a bar on the token, but not one that the officer had ever heard of. If it was, he'd gladly pay it a visit. A pint of beer was 60 cents in most places. Next, he found a small pile of banknotes, approximately $70 worth, but not one of them newer than 1876. If this man were an actor who'd been on stage that night, 
he was really playing the part. Further searching of the man's pockets revealed a bill for cleaning a carriage, the kind of carriage that a horse would pull. The address of the stable that produced the bill was on Lexington Avenue. A stable? Since when was there a stable on Lexington Avenue, the officer thought. Lexington was a nine-minute walk from Times Square, and the officer knew the area well. He'd never seen nor heard of there being a stable there. It made no sense. Neither did the third-place medal for the three-legged race he found. The next few objects actually did make some sense. There were business cards and a letter addressed to the same name on the cards. That name was Rudolf Fentz. Now he was getting somewhere. The man was Rudolf Fentz. Or, at least, a man acting as if he were Rudolf Fentz. You see, the letter was addressed to Rudolf Fentz, but it had been written 74 years earlier, in 1876. And not one of these strange objects showed signs of age. They were all crisp, seemingly new, and perfectly preserved. If they were real, and not stage props, that is. Disheartened, the officer turned the whole thing over to Captain Hubert V. Rim. Rim worked in the missing persons department, and it fell on him to identify the man if he wasn't, in fact, the Rudolph Fence on the business cards and letter. The address on the business cards and the letter was on Fifth Avenue, so he started there. That turned out to be an unfortunate dead end since the address given was that of a business, and the owner of the business had never heard of Mr. Fence. Next, Rim scoured the phone books he kept stored in his office. It was easy business given the last name, as there weren't that many fences listed. But he did have to go back quite a few years before he had his first positive hit. It was in the 1939 edition of the phone book, and it listed Rudolph Fence Jr. along with the address of an apartment building. Hoping to verify that he had the right man, Rim went straight to the apartment building in question and learned that Fence had lived there, but he wasn't the young man presently in the city morgue. According to the residents, Fence had been in his 60s. He no longer lived there either, but he had moved away after he'd retired. Perhaps the deceased was Fence's son. Further investigation led him to the sad discovery that Fence had died five years earlier. But he did have the address of Fence's widow, who, as luck would have it, was still alive and living in Florida. Where they'd gone to live after his retirement? Afraid that he was about to burden the poor woman with news that her son had been struck and killed by a car, Rim called her, only to learn that she did not have a son. Her husband had in fact been a junior, but he'd been named after his father, Rudolf Fence. And it had been a sad affair, she said. Her father-in-law had disappeared in 1876 when her husband had been just a little boy. His dad had gone out for an evening walk after kissing his wife goodbye and had disappeared. He'd been 29 years old. Rim confirmed the widow's story to be true, too. Being part of the missing persons department gave him access to old records, and there, in some files and folders from 1876, he found the strange, sad case of Rudolf Fence, age 29, who'd gone out for a walk one night, never to return. Or had he? Had Rudolf Fence in fact returned, not from his evening walk, but from wherever it was he had disappeared to? only to find himself standing in the middle of Times Square 74 years later. It was too much to consider, so Rim closed the case and never spoke of it again until years later, the details of which make up the story I just told you. A story that was written in 1951 by fiction writer Jack Finney. Finney is famous for writing The Body Snatchers, of which the movie The Invasion of the Body Snatchers was based, as well as some of the subsequent remakes. In 1951, he produced a short story titled I'm Scared, which contained the tale of a man named Rudolph Fence who accidentally tripped through time. The story was published in the September issue of Collier's. Collier's popularized the short story format, that strange tale, the one of Rudolph Fence, was subsequently repeated in a 1972 issue of the Journal of Borderland Research, and it was not identified as a piece of fiction. We know all of this thanks to researcher Chris Aubeck, who questioned the story and its origins. Aubeck concluded that Finney's short tale of time travel had made the journey from fiction to fact by being retold many times over throughout the years as is so often the case with stories. 
But what if the story doesn't end there? Here's where things get a bit muddy. Jack Finney did, in fact, write a story that contained the very events I've described as happening to an unfortunate young man named Rudolf Fence. It's a good story, and I love time travel stories. Time slips and time distortions will always capture my attention. Jack Finney also loved strange tales. He was, after all, a science fiction writer. What if his story had been based on real events, events that had taken place a year before he'd published I'm Scared in 1951? I'm not saying that this is true, and we've already seen how fact and fiction can be twisted into a very tangled knot, but, and this is an unverified but, there are rumors floating around that a researcher for the Berlin News Archive found a very odd newspaper article in 2007. The article was published in April 1951 and tells the story of a man who was wearing late 19th century clothes and was struck and killed by a car in 1950. Furthermore, it is said, that news article appeared five months before Finney's story. Could it be that Finney had heard of this story before adding his artistic flair to it? And could it also be true that researchers have even found references to an actual man who disappeared in 1876 at the age of 29? I think you'd even recognize that man's name. It is a strange tale. And the concept of time is even stranger. I'll leave the final word to Jack Finney, taken from his story, I'm Scared, published in 1951. For the first time in man's history, man is desperate to escape the present. Our newsstands are jammed with escape literature, the very name of which is significant. Entire magazines are devoted to fantastic stories of escape, to other times, past and future, to other worlds and planets. Escape to anywhere but here and now. Even our larger magazines, book publishers, and Hollywood are beginning to meet the rising demand for this kind of escape. Yes, there is a craving in the world like a thirst, a terrible mass pressure that you can almost feel of millions of minds struggling against the barriers of time. I'm utterly convinced that this terrible mass pressure of millions of minds is already slightly but definitively affecting time itself. In the moments when this happens, when the almost universal longing to escape is greatest, my incidents occur. Man is disturbing the clock of time, and I'm afraid it'll break. When it does, I leave to your imagination the last few hours of madness that will be left to us. All the countless moments that now make up our lives suddenly ripped apart and chaotically tangled in time. Thank you for listening. I'm Rick Coast, and if you haven't already, please subscribe and leave a review. You can also help support the show by going to strangeencounters.org. I would love to hear from you. I would also love to hear your suggestions for future episodes. And until next time, please take care of yourself. It's a strange world out there. Seven. 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 Seven.